We've become a society of instant. We want it now. But the sad thing is, there were people who were mocking God are the very people who don't want Him to come yet. And the reason they don't want Him to come yet is, well, they're really not ready. And that includes Christians. And we should praise God for His patience. We should thank Him on a daily basis that He has been patient enough to let us live another day and give us the opportunity to reach out to those. But God is patient with us because He loves us. He loves you. If I can, get your, uh, turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be coming out of 2 Peter. I hope everybody's doing well today. So how many of you uh, like to wait on things? Right? How many, how many like to wait on things? Right? How many times have you wanted something to happen so badly that you really got impatient with it? Right? I mean, honestly... Driving to church, that can happen because you hit every red light, right? And you're just like, come on, dude, really? We're run I'm running behind as it is, right? And I think sometimes patience can be really, really something hard to muster. Now, for me, uh, I feel like my patience are good in some areas, not so good in other areas. I'm a fisherman, so I got to have good patience, right? I'm a grandfather, so I need to have good patience. But when you get a five and six year old running me to death, it's a little hard to have, have patience with it, right? So we're going to continue talking about God's attributes, and that's the one thing we're going to talk about is the at attribute of God's patience. If I can get my clicker to work. There it goes. Because we know God is patient. God's patient. He's not indifferent, right? And so today we're going to look at some of the motivation, some of the motivation for God's patience, and we're also going to see some of the blessings from God's patience. Which when you really, when I was really putting this together and really looking at it, I'm very thankful for God's patience, right? First thing we're going to look at, God is patient, not indifferent, right? So we're going to start in verse 3. In 2 Peter, he writes here, he says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our ancestor died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. There's a, 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 a French proverb that says, laziness is often mistaken for patience. But I also think you could say patience is also mistaken for laziness, right? And I think a lot of times, maybe we, maybe we, we have trouble determining whether we're being patient or we're being lazy, Right? And I think that a lot of us falls into that. But you got to remember, this book was written about 30 years after the resurrection, right? And people were thinking what? Well, he's not doing what he said he's going to do in 30 years, right? He hasn't come back, so it, everything goes on as normal, right? But imagine now, we're, we're, we're over 2,000 years away, right? Peter tells us, that in the last days, which, by the way, we're living in the last days ever since the resurrection of Jesus, all right? That people would say that God's not even going to do what he says he's going to do, right? And there's even Christians, including myself, I don't get up thinking that Jesus is coming back today. Why? Well, it hasn't happened in 2,000 years. That can be my mindset sometimes, right? I think a lot of times we don't expect Jesus to come back anytime soon, if that makes sense. I think we tend to think that if something doesn't happen now, right, it, it, that it's not going to happen. I mean, I think about it as a kid, <clears throat> putting a frozen burrito in the oven and have to cook it for 30 minutes, right, to eat it. It was a long time. But now I get frustrated how to put one in the microwave for three minutes. We've become a society of instant. We want it now. Because honestly, hey, when I used to, some of you guys my age, when you went to the library when you was a kid, what'd you look up? You went to that little thing, you pulled it out, and you thumbed through. Well, I forget what they even called that thing. Until you find the book, right? Then you, okay, the book's here. So you walk over there, you find the book, right? How many people do that now? You got, you, you got your internet on the phone. 
You can look anything you want up on the phone, right? Because it's instant. Somebody says, hey, this is what's going on. No, it's not. You're lying, all right? But the sad thing is that there were people who were mocking God are the very people who don't want him to come yet. And the reason they don't want him to come yet is, well, they're really not ready. And that includes Christians, right? The second coming of Christ was preached a lot during the early ministries, right? The early church. Matthew and other uh, gospel writers wrote about it when Jesus told them he was re- going to return, right? Then we know Peter and Paul both wrote about the second coming, and which we'll see, we'll talk about a little bit today. But what we have to remember is that God is all powerful, right? We talked about that being one of his main attributes, is all powerful. Look what it says in verses five through seven. But they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's words, the heaven came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter's telling those who's questioning God, look, things don't always continue like we think. And he points out a historical event, right? He points out the flood. And Peter says, you guys have conveniently forgot about this. You forgot what he did. And what they were doing, they were kind of uh, 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 promoting their false teachings. So they were willingly ignoring the flood. And I think we've got to remember that God created everything from what? Nothing. God can wipe out everything, right, at any time. But the thing is, God's holding it together right now. God is holding it together until the day of judgment, right? Hebrews 1 tells us that he upholds all things by the power of his word. God exercised that judgment once when he flooded the earth, right? The very same word that created the earth is the very same word that destroyed the world by water. And it's the very same word that's holding everything together right now until the day of judgment. And we got to understand another thing is um, God doesn't work on our time, right? Look what it says here, verses 8 and 9. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, but as some understand slowness, Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What Peter's pointing out to their critics is just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen, right? And that's what we've got to remember. Because I think we, the longer, longer it goes, the easier it is to forget he's done it once, and it's going to happen again, right? He destroyed the earth with a flood and he's going to do the same thing right when Jesus comes because we're not operating on his timetable God doesn't work on the same timetable we do right Peter bases this particular uh, verse in verse 8 off the psalm uh, chapter 90 verse 4 which says for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by or as a watch in the night God lives in eternity. He's not bound by time or space like we are. Right? We're bound by time and space. Because God's on a different time frame doesn't mean that things, that he's indifferent about the return of Jesus. We know that he told us this is going to happen. Right? And we shouldn't look at the time that's gone by as an indication that it's not going to happen. Right? Just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. But the thing is, Lord is, the Lord is patient, right? He says, I'm patient. He's not eager to punish those who haven't come or those who have, have rejected him. Look what it says in um, second Tim, or first Timothy. It says, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. 
Who did he leave out of this? No one. He says all people, right? All people. So whether you're a Christian or not right now, God wants you to repent. God wants you to become a Christian. He wants you to become a disciple of Jesus, right? God's time frame is affected by his patience. And you can look in uh, Exodus 34, Numbers 14, Psalm 86, Jeremiah 15, just among them, a few of those that you see God's patience. But what is his motivation? What's God's motivation to have patience, right? Because we all know we don't, let's be honest, we don't have patience like we should, right? We don't have patience. Second point is the motivation for God's patience. We're going to look at right here. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's given everybody a chance. That's why Jesus hasn't come back. He's trying to say, look, my patience is going to run out eventually because Jesus is coming back. I told you it's going to happen. I, I, I took care of the world one time, and I'll do it again. Romans 2, 4 says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, his forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? His patience is intended for us to repent. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, we always need to repent. There's things in our lives that we need to repent from, right? And here we, God's telling us, hey, my kindness, I'm being patient with you guys, right? How many and grandparents, parents, how many times do you tell your kids, I'm losing my patience? Or, I'm going to count to three, Right? And they don't do anything until you get to, th then they, they start moving, right? But we got to learn to have patience. God is patient also in the Old, in the Old Testament. In 1 Peter 3.20, it speaks of the patience of the Lord during the days of Noah. Noah preached for how long? Anybody know? 120. 120 years, while he built the ark, he preached. No one entered the ark. But God was patient enough to give him 120 years to build the ark and to preach repentance to the people so they could be saved. How many people ended up on the, on the ark? Eight. All these people he preached to, what did they do? They mocked him. They laughed at him. And let's be honest. If Monroe starts building this big boat out front of his apartment, I'm going to be a little skeptical. <laughs> right? I mean, I could see those people. I mean, I could see that. But they were so far into sin, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe anything God had told them. And it's the same with Jonah, right? God sent Jonah to preach to the, to the, to the wicked people in the city of Nineveh, Right? The crazy thing is Jonah did not want to go because he was afraid God, that he would convince these people to repent and then God wouldn't, wouldn't have any wrath on them, right? But they didn't. Jonah got swallowed by the whale, right? But we all want to go to heaven. We want others to go to heaven, right? Repentance. We must repent if we're going to get into heaven. And when you think about the word repentance, there's so many ways to define it, Right? means, you know, people say, turn around, go the other way, right? Basically, it's a change of changing your mind, right? Because when you look in the context of the New Testament, it means that to change your mind concerning the way that you live and start living the way that God wants you to, right? Because if you start living the way God wants you to, you're going you're, you, you're gonna to turn from that other stuff, right? And I think we realize that our current life is not pleasing to God, Right? Because we're leaving Jesus out of the equation. To repent means that we're going to leave our old ways and adopt God's ways. And we've got to think about this. Once Jesus comes or you die, guess what? Game over. There's no second chance. Right? There's no second chance to repent. Jesus comes back. You can't say, hey, I'm going to repent. No. It doesn't work that way. When you die, you don't go to this little holding room and wait and say, hey, I want to do this. Can I get a do-over, right? It's like playing golf, mulligan. Give me a mulligan, 
right? Tennis, you get two serves, right? No. But you got, we got one shot at it. We got one shot at the repentance, but we also only got one shot to help others get there, which is really where God's patience comes in. He's given us the, opportun- the same opportunity that he gave Noah, right? Hey, it's going to happen. may not happen tomorrow, but it's going to happen. I'm giving you, I'm being patient. Get the word out. Spread the word. God's love for us motivates him to be patient with us. Because we know that the day of the Lord is coming. Look, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the the roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth. And everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. We need this time to repent because the day's coming, right? And he tells us, Peter tells us, it's going to come like a thief. Now, if you had a house and you knew that a thief was coming to break in, would you be prepared? Sure you would. You sure you would. I mean, people prepare for it now. People put alarms up and all kinds of things, right? But are you prepared for when Jesus comes back? We must always be ready. You've got to ask yourself, are you ready to, today, are you ready to stand judgment before God? Right? I mean, that's the, that's the thing. We, are we confident we can stand before God in judgment? Peter tells us all that, all that we, uh, everything will be destroyed by the Lord when he returns. We have to be ready for that. And that means giving your life to God, making amends with God, becoming a Christian, Right? I think a lot of people look at Jesus as an as a, uh, insurance policy, right? Just by going to church, right? But it's not. It's not. He's not an insurance policy. You need to devote your life to Christ. We need to devote our life to Christ. Because if, our, if we belong to Jesus, then we're going to do what we're called to do, right? And I think, again, after 2,000 years, it's really easy to say, uh, for us to think that the day's not going to happen in our, our lifetime. Right? But do we really know? I don't know. I could die tomorrow and the world go on, but we don't know when Jesus is going to return. Right? There's an old saying um, there's two things in life that you can count on. What is it? Death and taxes, right? Death and taxes. That's two things you can count on. And you guys all know me taxation is theft. I hate taxes. But you can cheat on your taxes and get away with it, right? You can and not pay, right? Let's be honest. People do it all the time. But the one thing you're not going to cheat is death. We're all going to have to face death. We're all going to have to face that judgment, right? And God wants us to have that time up to this to anticipate our new home, right? We got we to gotta quit focusing so much on what we're around now, right? Look here. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Since we're going to lose this home, guys, we're going to lose this. We need to be looking forward. Think about this. And this is, I, I, I don't know I read this. I think I read it. It was really, I, don't, I mean, I, I knew it, right? But I didn't really think about it. A hundred years from now, who's going to live in my house? Right? I mean, I do everything I do to take care of my house, but in a hundred years, it won't be me. It won't be Eve. Chances are it won't be any of my grandchildren. It'll be people I don't even know I ever heard of. Now, I'm not saying neglect what you need to do here on earth. Don't quit your job, nothing like that, right? I mean, I'm not saying you do that. 
But how important is it? What's really important is that we're looking forward to our new home. That home's in heaven, right? But it's going to require something, right? It's going to be us for you to, to be holy in our conduct, and we need to con conduct ourselves in a godly manner. And what that means is our beliefs should translate into a changed life. Our lives should be changed. We'll be different than in the world, and we'll, and we'll have a different, we'll conduct ourselves different in the world, and we'll have a complete different attitude. In Hebrews 11, it reminds us that we're just passing through, right? This is just a stopover, right? Yeah, okay, it's like driving and flying in a jet. You got a layover. We're just having an extra long layover right now because we're going someplace else, right? And that's what we all should be striving for, right? Peter tells us that we should think and act like one whose citizenship is in heaven, right? We should act that way. Verse 13 tells us that the righteousness dwells in our new home. And righteousness basically means do what's right. Do it God's way. It's the will to do the right thing, which is what God wants us to do, right? Verse 14 tells us that God's patience allows us to work on being found spotless and blameless. Because when we're baptized into Jesus... God declares us righteous, he declares us pure, he declares us spotless and blameless, right? Then our lives after that is trying to reflect, reflect Jesus to the world. That makes sense, right? We've got to reflect to the world what God has done for us, how our lives have changed, how our lives are much better than they were in the old times when we were out there doing whatever we wanted to. But when the, uh, the patience of God runs out and the end comes, we need to be found in Christ. We're told that we need to be found by him in peace. We are to be at peace with man. We are to be at peace with God. And the only way to make peace with God is how? Through Jesus. That's it. Right? If we don't belong to Jesus, then we're not going to be at peace with God. As time passes, we'll look forward to our new home, right? Verse 12 tells us that we are to greatly desire, greatly desire the coming of our new home. We're to look forward to heaven. And sometimes I think we get wrapped up into ourselves and we, don't, we think about, well, I really don't want, because I really don't want to die. But if I remain in Christ, what I have here is going to be so much better there in heaven. The excitement should cause us to work hard, to be prepared at all times in case it happens. We're there. We got a spot in heaven. The last thing, the ultimate blessing of God's patience for us. The ultimate blessing that we have because of God's patience is found in verse 15. It says, bear in mind that the Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. So we're told to regard patience of the Lord as a salvation. Why? Well, let's be honest. If God wasn't patient, none of us would be here because we would have died the first day we decided to sin. Right? He would have took us out. But it's patience. It keeps us here. None of us would be very old. We wouldn't be here. So instead of thinking of God as indifferent, we should look at his patience as an opportunity to win more people to God, right? While we still have time. So if I ask you guys, if I guaranteed you today, June 1st, Jesus will be back. If I guaranteed that, would there be some people that you know, friends or family, that you would go to right away and try to get them to study the Bible to understand the importance? Because Jesus is going to be here June 1st. This gives you a little over a month. Would you go out and do that? Would you share the gospel with them? In that little bit of time in between. I mean, don't you have friends and loved ones that, that, that you want to see get to heaven? We all do, right? 
Now, I want you to think about those people for a few seconds. Where are they at in their walk with God, right? Because here's the deal. Here's the deal. Everyone in your life will have a last day with you, and you don't even know when that's going to be. Everybody in your life will have a last day with you, and you do not know when that day is going to be. Think about that. Are you ready? Are there things that you need to repent of before June 1st gets here? Things you need to change before June 1st gets here? Now, obviously, I can't guarantee June 1st, but I do know that we need to get things in order because God's patience, right? He's patient, but we don't know when the end's coming. We need to use our time wisely to reach out to others. So as we close out, patience is a hard thing to come by, especially in our instant society nowadays, right? Everything is a, is a now on it now, but the great thing is God is patient. God is patient. He didn't send Jesus back yet because... He doesn't want anyone to be left out of his kingdom. He wants everyone into heaven. And we should praise God for his patience. We should thank him on a daily basis that he has been patient enough to let us live another day. And give us the opportunity to reach out to those. But God is patient with us because he loves us. He loves you. He sent his son to die in our place for the sins, right? God wants nothing more than to see us in heaven. But for those who don't know how to do it, we're the ones, we're the ambassadors. We got to help them, right? They got to hear the word. They got to believe the word. They need to repent, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized. That's our calling. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be reaching out, sharing our lives with people, tell them who we used to be and who we are today. And we can do that by giving Jesus our life. That's the only way we can do that. And when we do that, we can reward God for his patience. Amen? Thank you, guys.